I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. Lee Allen Dugatkin went looking for trouble. Not that he wanted to start trouble, he wanted to find trouble. And from battalions of mongooses squared off against each other, to hermit crabs evicting each other in the quest for the perfect shell, to ravens rallying their brothers to back them up in a rumble, all this behavior looks like a very familiar kind of trouble. They're using much more complicated ways to attain power. The kind of things that we, I would say, until maybe 20 years ago or so, just associated with humans. Power in the Wild. It's a crisp book title. Dugatkin's subtitle intrigues me even more. The Subtle and Not-So-Subtle Ways Animals Strive for Control Over Others. But this isn't a story of animals that mirror humans, not exactly. Yes, we'll be talking plenty about battling and duking things out, but what Degat can discover in the end, he's a behavioral ecologist, is that intraspecies fighting counterintuitively leads to more peace and harmony within that species. Struggle begets stability. The wild world may not be so utterly wild after all. Degat can observe that there may even be some wisdom here for us animals, uh, us human animals, that is. I got going with Lee Allen Dugatkin by bringing up a picture from his book. It's a photo of two phalanxes of mongooses, or mongeese, if you will. That's an acceptable plural. These mongeese are similar to weasels, the plural of which is not woozles, with their little round ears and pointy noses. So when you've got two mongoose armies facing off to do battle like the redcoats and revolutionaries... Those sharp, pointy noses really give them a a determined, even a menacing kind of a look. The battle lines come at each other, comrades, shoulder to shoulder, and when they engage, the fur really flies. Well, it would be too easy to conclude they're fighting over territory, but that's too hasty. It's more about mating, and it's not really the males engaged in classic testosterone-fueled head-to-head combat, you know, like rams or bucks. It's this really interesting dynamic between the males and females. So the mongooses, they have, you know, really well-defined home areas that, that are theirs. And, and they can border each other. And, and, and groups have both males and females. The interesting thing is that the groups tend to have a lot of blood relatives in them. And so the females, they don't want to mate with their blood relatives for the same reason we don't, because of all kinds of genetic problems that occur. So what they do is they leave their group and they go over to a nearby group. Now, when they do that, the males from their group don't like that, okay, because they want to mate with the females anyway. And so they follow the females over to the other group. Now, the males in the other group have an intense reaction to the males from that first group coming in, and that's what triggers the warfare between the two groups. And the really cool thing is that it looks like what the females are doing is while the males are going at it in those two groups in their war, they're just mating with a few of the males who aren't in that group they moved into. So they're like facilitating the the battle in order to be able to mate with males from the other group because that's what they want to do. So it's really quite sophisticated. Now, there is going to be a bridge for us to cross to get from mongooses and their hierarchical uh, wrangling, if you want to call it that, and hermit crabs of all creatures. Uh, Can you help me cross that bridge? Uh, Let's talk hermit crabs and then tell me a little bit more about why people are studying these social behaviors, the balance of power within a species. Hermit crabs are uh, not as fierce, perhaps, but just as concerted in their efforts to get what they want. They are. And it's a little bit different in the sense that it's not like a group warfare thing. This is pretty much one-on-one battles. And, you know, I would agree that they're a bit less fierce, but from a hermit crab perspective, I mean, they have these, a giant claw, essentially. And that claw can be quite dangerous um, when it comes to fighting other hermit crabs. And in the hermit crab case, it's all about 
what kind of shell you live in. So the Kermit crabs themselves, they're, they're, they're soft and they, and they need to find a shell out there and they move into it and then they basically carry their home on their back and this makes them safe from all kinds of predators. And the power struggles that happen in these hermit crabs are all about getting the best shells. And the best shell isn't always the biggest one. It's the one that fits on you ideally and and allows you to both move around and have protection. If you have too big a shell, you really can't move around. If you have too little a shell, you really can't move in there and it doesn't give you a lot of protection. So the males are always jousting and trying to get the best shell. And that sometimes means just leaving the shell you're in. If you see an empty shell out there, you go get it. But many times it means fighting somebody else because their shell is better for you than the one you have. And the hermit crabs are really good at judging this. They can see the shell that the other animal has. And what they do is they kind of go up to it and they start tapping on it with their claws. And that, by listening to the echo and other things, they can kind of judge how good a shell this is. And then if it's a good shell, you get a fight. And um, usually the larger individuals win this fight. And sort of when it's over, they basically just pull the other smaller crab out and they move in for themselves. And now the other little unprotected crab has to go around and find a shell for themselves. Now, there are probably yet other crabs that are smaller than it that it can evict from a shell um, and pick it up. But this sort of, so it's kind of this constant thing where you're moving, where the animals are moving from shell to shell and battling it out. Um, and people have done all these cool experiments in the laboratories where they can actually really figure out what the Kermit crabs want in a shell. And if you look at the way they fight, they, they're, they're really strategic about getting just that right shell. Position and positioning are socially conditioning. How you're born, how you're bred, predetermine who you wed, which means there's nothing changeable, nothing's rearrangeable. Position and positioning are everything in life. I was thinking about society and, and, and what is changeable and what is rearrangeable in power structures and in, in social uh, connections that we have. And the story you tell is that among various species, within a species, things are changing. There's a top dog, and there's somebody at the bottom, and it, it's not set. It is rearrangeable. It absolutely is rearrangeable. And basically, this is what animals are, are, are sort of constantly doing, right? The reason that, as an animal, you want to move up and that's power structure, is because if you're at the top of the power structure, it typically means more mates, more food, all that kind of thing. So there's this constant battling going on to, to rise up there. Now, the neat thing about studying this in animals is it turns out that it's, it's like way more complex than we used to think it was in the sense that, yeah, it, it matters if, if you're large and, and a good fighter, but that's not all that matters. There are these really subtle, complex ways that animals are jousting for power, and it doesn't always involve beating up somebody else. So, you know, in the book, I'm telling these stories where there are these great spies out there, animal spies. So we did work in my own lab where we were working with these tiny fish. They're called sword tails. You can buy them in a little, you can go over to your aquarium store and you can buy them They're like two inches long or something. And we know from the way they behave in, in the wild that they're always fighting with each other and they're, and they're always jousting for power in one way or another. But it turns out that it's so much more interesting. So basically, what these fish are doing is they're spying on the battles between other fish, other swordfish. And so they see, you know, two other sword tails. These are males typically. So they see, you know, sword tail Joe and sword tail Mike fighting each other. They then use the information from who won that fight to determine what they're going to do when they interact with Swordtail Joe or Swordtail Mike, right? And so what that means is if they interact with someone who they saw win a fight, they're um, much more reticent. They're not likely to get into a very intense skirmish with them. If they see somebody who lost, 
It's even more interesting because when they see somebody who's lost, they make this really kind of almost human-like fine scale calculation. If they see somebody that's lost, but that individual has put up a good fight when losing, they're less likely to go after them than if they see somebody who lost and they just gave up. And, you know, we actually see the same sort of thing in penguins in New Zealand, where they're paying, they're listening for these very dramatic things called triumph calls that, that males who won give off. And if they hear that after they've seen a fight, they really stay away from the individual who won a fight. And you can actually even kind of trick them. You put these microphones out there and you play this dramatic triumph call and you can see their heart rate goes up. They start making all kinds of sounds themselves that are associated with a potential dangerous situation. If they hear a loser, they behave very, very differently. All of a sudden, I'm just thinking about high school and how I never took on the athletes. You know, I just kind of hung back, but, but I watched what they were doing. And I had to calibrate my behavior in relation to the power structures around me. That's, that's high school. That's junior high for that matter. <laughs> well, I want to insert you now into a story. It's your story, actually, about going to a place near Vienna in Austria. And, and you somehow, as a human being among wolves, then make a foray into the society somehow. You're guided by somebody. Tell us that story about where you fit in. Were you the alpha? So I was lucky enough, I was giving some lectures in, in Vienna, and about an hour outside of Vienna, there's this wolf science park. And it's really this incredible place where, they, where they're doing all kinds of scientific studies on wolf packs and dog packs. And the person who runs it, Kurt Koschel, was my host, and he was taking me around. I actually got to go in and interact with some of these wolves, which is something you don't do unless he's with you. But I got a chance to interact with them. He basically laid out the, the rules for how you deal with the wolves, which is that, you know, you will get on to your knees there. You will um, look them in the eye and don't turn away and we'll see everything should be fine. And, you know, he has food in his pocket and the wolves expect that from Kurt. And so they, they kind of like having him around. So I went in there and I got down on my knees and I think the largest wolf in there came over to me um, slowly and um, he was a foot away from me and all of a sudden he um, put his paw on my shoulder. You could feel the power that this animal had. I and mean, it's one thing to look at them and you, and you realize how strong you think they are, but until they put their paw just gently on you, you just don't realize the power that these animals have. And it was really an awe-inspiring experience for me. But more interesting was that we were sort of walking around and there are these wolf packs and there are these dog packs. And they're just such different dynamics going on. So in the wolf pack, what we, we walked by one, it was a small group, two or three individuals. And in that group, one of the wolves basically was sort of sitting on top of the other wolf and kind of had the subordinate, the lower ranking wolf that it was sitting on, it, the, the more powerful individual had its jaws sort of locked onto the skull of the other individual, not, not hurting it, but basically just making it very, very clear what was going on. And what my host, Kurt, told me was that powerful wolf was making it clear to a number of different parties. First of all, it was making it clear to the other wolf in its pack. And second of all, it was making it clear to us as the observers that it was the top wolf in this pack. And it turns out that the wolves are really subtle and complex about the way that their power dynamics work. When you go over to the dogs, they're a bit more violent and they have more skirmishes um, than the wolves do. And Kurt and others think this is because the dogs can hurt each other but not to the extent that wolves can hurt each other. So wolves kind of have to be careful about really scaling up violence because they could get killed if they do that. So it, it tends to be a lot of kind of ritualistic things. The dogs are a bit more kind of herky-jerky. They're always fighting with each other. They're always trying to rise up in the dominance hierarchy. At least there they were. 
Yeah, I want to throw out a term here that we all use. I don't even know if it can apply to animals. It's, it's, civilized is the word. Uh, can we talk right. about wolves or, or dog packs as being civilized? You're talking about levels of sophistication and nuanced communications of power. Uh, c- civilized? Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, that might be stretching it a little bit. I guess it sort of depends on what you mean. If by civilized you mean that it's not not just sort of trying to cut the throat of everybody above you in order to get what you want, then absolutely. A- absolutely. I mean, you know, we've talked about some examples. There are others that show this, that the animals are, they're using much more complicated ways to attain power. The kind of things that we, I would say until maybe 20 years ago or so, just associated with humans. I mentioned the swordtail fish and, and the penguins, and what they're doing is they're spying on others. But there's this other phenomenon that goes on, and ravens are great for this, and ravens are great for everything. They're incredibly intelligent animals. So in in ravens, you have this thing called the audience effect. And all the audience effect means is that if you have two ravens that are involved in some sort of aggressive interaction, what they do is the way they interact with each other depends on who's watching them. Not who they're watching, but who's watching them, what the audience is made up of. And in Ravens, what you find is that if an individual is losing some sort of fight with somebody else, it will really up how many loud calls it makes if the audience is made up of its friends and its family. Because what happens is the audience members then tend to come in and help it. Okay, But... If it's losing that fight and the audience is made up of the friends and relatives of the other raven who's beating it up, the loser doesn't give off these really loud calls. In fact, they get quieter because they know that if if there's noise and attraction to what they're doing, the ones that are going to come over now are the friends and family of the individuals already beating you up, and that's only going to make it worse for you. So this idea that they're actually paying attention to who's watching them and then changing their behavior there. Again, civilized is a tricky word, but I would say that's bordering civilized. I'm just interested in something served from an evolutionary perspective in these power structures where stability is achieved through dynamics that are not equitable. Yeah, this is a great question. And and there's actually been a lot of work on this in animal behavior. Um, One of the benefits of egalitarian societies, of societies that have a very clear power structure, is that everybody knows where they are. So they're still jostling. Everybody's trying to move up, but animals know their position. And that tends to kind of minimize the overall amount of aggression. Because if you know that you're likely to lose if you try and fight somebody above you, then you're less likely to do that. You you might still do it, but you're less likely. And that kind of creates a stability in the sense that now that society or that group of animals can spend, the individuals in it can spend a little bit more time looking for food and a good shelter and that sort of thing. How that plays out compared to more egalitarian societies in monuments is something that people are intensely studying. So here's what I'm hearing now, Lee, um, and I'll tell you a little short story to kind of set this up. I have a, a boy who, when he was just four years old, he came home one day and he said, if people bees mean to me, I bees mean to them, that is my natural way. Uh, when I think about, you know, it's like, and that's not terribly sophisticated. That's just, if you if you hit me, I'll hit you back. Um, what I hear in you is genuine excitement about the incredible complexity, the nuance, the sophistication of these interactions. Is is the excitement because this should be surprising to us? There are different components to the excitement depending on who you're talking to. So if you talk to people who study like what I study, it's that it's just more and more evidence that so many of the things that we assumed were uniquely human aren't. And you tend to see these things, often in, in simpler forms, granted, but still real in in non-humans. Now, if you're listening and you're that doesn't particularly excite you, what I would say is that what might be exciting is that this potentially 
can help us better understand and hopefully kind of mitigate aggression and violence in humans. And the reason is that if all animals did was basically try and slit the throat of everybody above them, they wouldn't be particularly useful in terms of understanding our kind of complex power dynamics because they're so they're so detailed, our, our own. But now, all of a sudden, we have this kind of treasure chest of information from non-humans that we can potentially sort of pull things out of that might be useful to humans. I always tell my friends, if you're interested in, in human power dynamics, you have a problem, which is that at the species level, you have a sample size of one because there's just one human species. But now all of a sudden, you know, if everything from chimpanzees and bonobos and hermit crabs and sword tail fish and, and mongooses are using these behaviors that are similar to some of the things we see in humans, we can start looking to see when are they spying on each other and, and when are they paying attention to who's watching them and maybe kind of pull little threads out that might be useful to understand our own power dynamics. Lee Allen Degatkin is a behavioral ecologist at the University of Louisville. He's author of Power in the Wild, The Subtle and Not-So-Subtle Ways Animals Strive for Control Over Others. Degatkin says that turmoil and strife and contestation within a species can actually be a mechanism that clears the way for these animals to keep doing everything they need to do to survive as a group, eating, guarding their homes, producing offspring. In short, it can be a way of making their lives, their societies, more stable. Next on Constant Wonder, we're going to meet a philosopher, a literary type, who went to the seashore and all childlike went about the business of building some pools, building tide pools. Initially, this was a quest for stillness and reflection, uh, reflection of both kinds, I suppose. He wasn't looking for trouble at all. But instead of finding that tranquility, what he found was... Healthy ecologies systems in which the organisms are constantly and almost sort of perfectly at each other's throat. More talk about tussles in the animal kingdom in our next conversation on Constant Wonder. Maybe even a few lessons about what humans might learn from these tense, sometimes fierce, sometimes violent or even fatal struggles. I'm Marcus Smith. Today's episode was produced by Tenery Taylor, Daniel McDonald, and Mamie Teeples. Our thanks to Parker Schmidt, Mitchell Towsley, and the sound design team at BYU Broadcasting. Constant Wonder is a production of BYU Radio.